Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Space Place Canada's third event. This is Northern Lights, When the Planetariums Came to Canada. Uh, my name is Kirsten Vanstone, and I'm a Space Place director and a planetarium enthusiast. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Though we are at opposite ends of a YouTube feed, please interact with us. If you are logged into YouTube, use the comments to make comments or ask questions. I can see them here in our broadcast studio and we'll pass them along to our speaker. You can also reach us on Twitter, which is at SpacePlaceCDA with comments and questions. And if you'd rather not do that publicly, you can email chair at SpacePlaceCanada.ca. We may ask you some questions too. And if we do, please use the YouTube comments box to answer them or to generally show off your planetarium knowledge. Now, as most of you know, Space Place formed with the ultimate goal of bringing a first-class planetarium to Toronto, a big one, well-equipped. We are building support through virtual planetarium activities, and if you haven't yet, please do visit our website, spaceplacecanada.ca. We want to give a platform to the Canadian experience of crossing the boundary between Earth and space, and this includes perspectives and voices from Canada's many different cultures, from people who work in Canada's aerospace industry, and in Canada's astronomical community. We also would like to make sure we include voices, as I said, from many different cultures and including those that are Indigenous to these shores. Now, most of you are here tonight because you, like us, had a transformative experience in a planetarium at one time or other. Now, my goal is to bring that experience to my children, and currently to do that, we have to travel outside of Toronto. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some really good small planetarium domes in Toronto, including the first one I ever worked at, at the Ontario Science Centre. But there's nothing like sitting under a large dome, gazing up, and taking a mental wander through the cosmos, right in the middle of the daytime. Or, you know, whatever else you might have done under a planetarium dome. If you had an experience in a planetarium in Canada, chances are that our guest tonight had some part to play in it. And I'll get to that in a minute. But I did want to thank those of you who became members of Space Place at our inaugural event last January. And you may have participated in our annual general meeting and been to some of these events. We've had two prior before this one. Uh, you, like us, believe that a good science visualization theater belongs in Toronto. This is, after all, the center of the universe. And I'll apologize once again to my friends who run the actual center of the universe, which is in Victoria, British Columbia. But I do have some membership news for you. Uh, if you joined for one year, it's actually time to renew. So I'm going to show some slides to uh, show you what we have on offer. So let's see here. Whoop, I'm in the wrong part of my slides. Here we go. Going back up. There we are. Okay, so to renew your membership, we are asking for $50 to renew. And this is a limited time offer. If you renew tonight, we'll send you one planetarium music download card. So if you ever attended McLaughlin Planetarium, this card will allow you to download music from two of the composers who used to do music for McLaughlin Planetarium, including an Academy Award winner, Michael Dana. Whoop, and that's not working very well. Let me go back here. Okay, uh, here we go. This is not going smoothly. <laughs> If you renew your membership for $50 and add a $25 donation, we'll add this stylish Space Place face mask. You don't have to turn into Henry Lowton, our chair here, who was modeling it for you, but this could be very handy over the next few months. This is, of course, in addition to the Planetarium Music download card. And next, let's see if this works. For $100, which is a membership renewal and a $50 donation, we'll add to the download card and the face mask the book, Outer, uh, Earthling's Guide to Outer Space by Bob McDonald. Some of you may already have that, but if you don't, you can always get an, a, a copy for yourself or perhaps a new copy for somebody you know. So if you are interested in doing that, um, you can send an email to chair at spaceplaceplanetarium.ca Whoops, <laughs> to um, arrange for that. You can also, if you don't want to become a member, you can just donate to Space Place Canada. And if you donate $25, you get the download card. You donate $50, you get the download card and the mask and $75 will throw in that book. Okay, so if you'd like to do that, again, you can actually go to spaceplacecanada.ca and click donate by PayPal, or you can send uh, an email to chair at spaceplacecanada.ca. If you are interested in becoming a member and are not one right now, you can send your interest uh, in an email again to chair at spaceplacecanada.ca. 
Okay, now before we go any further, I do wanna mention that we have had some very generous support from Stradia, who has been helping uh, put our website and digital visual brand together, Global Public Affairs, who's helping us navigate public affairs, and of course, MDA, they are our Jupiter sponsor. Now, um, I wanna get back to this evening's uh, festivities, and I'm going to be introducing the person who is at the center of our um, program tonight. I just got to find myself here. Um, I first met our speaker tonight at an International Planetarium Society conference, and then he visited the planetarium where I was working in San Francisco. And uh, we actually, I ended up taking him up as part of a small um, group observing the Leonid meteors in 1999. It was when they stormed. It was very, very impressive. So I always remember Ian was on that uh, event with us and that, that was pretty cool. But back then, didn't really have quite a handle on what sorts of things Ian had done and the contributions that he has made to the museum and uh, cultural sector. So he is now a consultant and he helps to make museums and science centers and planetariums better places to visit. And he has extensive experience in public project planning, uh, conceptual strategic planning and management of public projects in cultural and educational organizations, museums, planetariums, science interpretation centers, all with an emphasis on creative thinking, exhibit development, production management, feasibility, governance, a whole bunch of things. He's actually worked on nearly 100 projects in six different countries. Now, some things you should also know about Ian that won't appear in his official biography is that he has been everywhere. He loves to travel and post photos of his travels and makes many of us very, very jealous. Uh, he's been stuck at home since last year, like the rest of us. So now he's just posting beautiful photographs of Vancouver and making us all very jealous. That is where Ian lives. But relating to our event tonight, Ian was the first director of Canada's first public planetarium. I would like to say, if you know the name of that planetarium, put it in the YouTube comments and see if you can impress your friends. Well, you're going to hear it anyway in just a second, because I want to tell you that there's a little bit of news from that stint as the first uh, planetarium director in Canada. Ian has had, and I'm going to share my screen again, has had a street named after him. So the road going up in front of this planetarium is now called Ian McLennan Way. So how many people do you know that have had a road named after them? So here's a photograph of Ian. I don't know how long ago this was, I'm not going to say, and I do notice we have some people from TELUS World of Science on our stream tonight, so I wanna thank you for not asking to steal this image from your website. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful picture and neat to see. I advise you all to go and look it up, TELUS World of Science, edmonton.ca. Okay, now, Without further ado, I have blabbed long enough, so I'm going to leave the screen now and turn it over to our planetarium impresario, Ian McLennan, who is going to take us on a tour of the early planetariums in Canada. And then I'm going to come back on and we are going to chat for a little while. I get to ask all the questions that I've wanted to ask Ian for all these years. And then we will take some questions from you again through the comment box in YouTube. So over to you, Ian. Thanks, Kirsten, and uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be here with uh, everybody and to uh, engage in a conversation about the, uh, the, the the whole idea of establishing a new planetarium in Toronto. Toronto is a major city in the world, as well as in Canada, and it deserves to have its own major planetarium. It once had one, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, but it hasn't had one for several years, except for the small planetariums that Kirsten uh, mentioned. And those, uh, incidentally, have some significance as well. And we wouldn't mind talking about that in a subsequent uh, Space Place event. But uh, the focus of uh, tonight's presentation is basically on uh, the major planetariums that have been established in Canada, most of them going back to the 1960s when uh, the Canadian centennial was taking place. So I'm going to uh, share my screen right now and engage in a presentation that will take you, I hope, on, on this 
uh, tour that uh, I mentioned. Did you see the woodcut here, Kirsten? I, I think probably yes. Yes. <laughs> um, the, one of the early planetariums in uh, Canada, dating back to the centennial, was the H.R. McMillan Planetarium, which is now the H.R. Uh, McMillan Space Center in Vancouver. Um, I was uh, the consultant on this project. I was living in Rochester, New York at the time. I had moved to Rochester from Edmonton to establish the Strassenburg Planetarium, but I was commuting back and forth uh, to Vancouver, uh, consulting on the establishment of this rather remarkable planetarium. Remarkable, among other things, because of its setting. It's hard to imagine a more scenic setting for a planetarium than this. Um, I think Rio de Janeiro might compete in um, a couple of other places, but uh, this is a, a, a really amazing place. Now, um, among other things, uh, the planning for this planetarium was difficult. There was an architect on it who uh, had a fixed idea about the format of the building. And uh, he said, you put your bloody toys wherever I, I tell you to put them. <laughs> and and uh, I, I, I've since worked with architects who are a little bit uh, more uh, accommodating than, than that. Nevertheless, we did come up with um, a, a a really important uh, set of innovations as far as the theater is concerned. We lowered the spring line of the dome just like we did in Rochester uh, so that you came into the theater uh, underneath the lip of the dome through a, a tunnel. Um, and we put the... Uh, Ian, I'm sorry if you can uh, hear me. We've lost your audio. Well, Ian works that out. <laughs> I'm just going to, I was typing away in the chat that, yes, this is a solar system. Thank you very much for noticing, Rocky. Also, uh, Ian noticed something called the spring line. It's mentioning, oh, here we go. Hold on. Uh, Ian, I see your microphone is muted on my screen. Maybe that's the problem. Do you see your little your little uh, icon at the bottom? You can unmute it. Can you see that? The joys <laughs> of live. So, um, hey, there's Sarah Missouri. There you are. I, I, I unmuted, but I had to get out of the production in order to do that. So. No problem. I shall. Uh, okay, so. Can you re uh, start your presentation? Because we can see your screen now. Yeah, perfect. Okay, there you go. Thank you. So I, I was saying that uh, we, uh, did, did it just go silent when we were talking about Harold? It, it went silent before you started talking about Harold, but I really want to meet Harold. And <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So Harold was the name of the Zeiss projector from uh, from Zeiss in East Germany and Jena in East Germany, and uh, it was a very sophisticated instrument at the uh, at the time. Now, one of the aspects of the H. R. Macmillan Planetarium that uh, was quite important was the actual management of it. We uh, uh, David Roger uh, came out of the broadcasting business like I had. Um, he started in Edmonton, in fact, and um, moved to Vancouver. He actually was negotiating with both Toronto and Vancouver at the same time and, and had decided that whichever uh, offer came first, he would pursue, he would go to. And uh, the Vancouver offer came in a day before Toronto. And I've often thought that uh, the whole Toronto planetarium scene would have been completely different if David had moved there. David was, um, uh, because he came out of the broadcasting and promotion field, he, he uh, put a great deal of emphasis on 
on the production aspects of the show as well as uh, public uh, notice and, and promotion and uh, that uh, it stood, it stood very well in terms of uh, the visibility of the planetarium at the same time in uh, Vancouver uh, there was planning in underway for Expo 86 and one of the features that was being planned for Expo 86 was a preview center and this preview center uh, opened in 1985 uh, prior to the exposition in 86 and had an Omnimax uh, projection system in it and uh, and that still is in operation today but is undergoing some renovations and when the renovations are complete it will have planetarium capability and so it will be interesting to see how this meshes with the programming at the H.R. Macmillan Planetarium and Space Center. As Kirsten mentioned, the first planetarium in Canada was the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium, which uh, was built in, uh, in 1960 to commemorate the visit to Edmonton in 1959 of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. They planted a tree in Coronation Park uh, because the planetarium wasn't completed at that point. Um, and, um, and, and later on, the planetarium was constructed. And um, um, a couple of weeks before the opening, everybody began to realize this was going to be a bigger deal than everybody thought. It was going to be operated just by volunteers from the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, and so I was approached to uh, as to whether I would be interested in taking over as the director and and I did take it on. There's a long story behind that. But the we didn't know what we were doing at that time. We we uh, we made a lot of mistakes in the planning. We, we ordered a, a very simple dodecahedron uh, planetarium projector from the Spitz company in Yorkland, Delaware. It wasn't terribly sophisticated, so we surrounded it with uh, all kinds of special effects and sound effects and lighting and uh, had a composer to, to do special music and uh, all of this thing came together in a dramatically short period of time. Um, but it was, uh, the shows were very popular and uh, the planetarium itself was popular and so much so that later on it was decided that a new facility had to be uh, built and uh, with uh, the help of uh, John Holt, a visionary at the time, the late John Holt, uh, planning was underway for a new center, the uh, TELUS World of Science in Edmonton, which was opened in 1984. And in that uh, facility, there was a, um, a space theater, a designer space theater. Um, since then, uh, Alan Nursall has taken over as the director, uh, taking over from George Smith, and both of them were visionaries who uh, planned uh, for uh, the continuation of the operation of the Ziegler Space Theater, as well as new facilities, including the Northern uh, Arctic Center and other uh, features that are uh, in, including a, a temporary exhibition gallery. The, the, the Ziedler Space Theater uh, was a very sophisticated theater of its time. John Holt uh, planned a, a theater uh, that borrowed ideas from a lot of the major uh, planetariums, including Rochester, uh, uh, San Diego, um, um, many other places. Uh, but he put his own stamp on it as well. And uh, since then, it has been upgraded with new dome and new seats, and, uh, and it's quite an elegant facility. And as you can see, it doesn't have a Zeiss projector anymore. That Zeiss projector will now become uh, a feature in the exhibition area. Um, and, and we hope that uh, that will become a, a, an attractive feature and part of the history of the place. Um, and of course, because the, the, the projector has been removed, there, there, you can do theater in the round and have presenters right in the middle of the audience. And one of the aspects of the, the space theater in Edmonton that I'm particularly fond of is contemporary programming that includes reference to indigenous sky lore and many other stories that uh, 
that typically are forgotten in planetariums. They, they tend to, to dwell a lot on the ancient Greek constellations uh, and, uh, and don't concentrate enough on the indigenous stories from our own past. The um, to about 300 kilometers south of uh, Edmonton, there is, um, of course, the city of Calgary uh, didn't want to be outdone and wanted to build a major planetarium and eventually built a planetarium to celebrate the centennial of Canada in 1967. Jack Long was the, uh, the architect of this and he designed an, uh, a piece of architecture that people either loved or hated. I loved it, I thought it was great. Um, but a lot of people didn't like the bunker style of uh, the, the building. It was a difficult building actually to, to work in and work around, um, as I will mention in more detail in a minute. Um, the concrete uh, bunker style was eventually altered somewhat uh, by an architect, uh, Bill Chomick, a local architect who uh, became quite transfixed about the idea of planetariums and say more about that in, in a moment. But he added splashes of color as well as addressing some of the deficiencies of the inside of the building and um, um, managed to uh, create a, um, a space that worked uh, a lot better. And eventually it was decommissioned as a planetarium um, and uh, Bill Chomick was the uh, architect uh, and uh, chair of the Contemporary Art Society of uh, Calgary, and the planetarium was eventually turned into a contemporary art center, um, and uh, and then it was replaced by a whole new science center, Telespark in Calgary, uh, that uh, Bill Chomick was also involved in, as far as the theater itself was concerned, and um, this was a project that was spearheaded by Bill Peters. Um, a visionary uh, Calgarian who uh, spent uh, many years promoting the idea of this new science center to replace the, uh, the now aged and uh, defunct science center at Miwata Park. Um, one of the features in Telespark uh, is a, a giant uh, screen theater that uh, has a significant rake floor and uh, about 188 seats. Um, and uh, it was a, a theater that was, was very often used for a combination of live events and pre-recorded events, and sometimes live events that were tied into astronomical or space events. And some of these were uh, produced and hosted by uh, a well-known amateur astronomer, Alan Dyer. Uh, and these were extremely popular and uh, actually form a, a model for uh, planetarium programming where you can combine these live and pre-recorded events. Farther east, uh, the Manitoba Museum uh, built a planetarium uh, also in connection with the Centennial of Canada. This was opened, I believe, in 1968. Um, and um, every time I see this image, I get a little angry uh, because I wanted to be the consultant on this project, uh, but they insisted on hiring a PhD astronomer from uh, the Hayden Planetarium in New York. Uh, and uh, he saddled them with a 1939 design for the planetarium that uh, where there was no elevator for the projector and uh, the, the dome was very high. There wasn't a uh, a horizon you could look across, you had to look up out, out of a well. And so I was a bit angry. Nevertheless, uh, Scott Young, uh, the director there, has made the best of that facility and in the true tradition of, uh, of innovative planetarium thinkers, uh, he has done some really wonderful things in that uh, planetarium theater with a, a lot of special effects uh, and uh, with good music tracks and so forth, working with the Evans and Sutherland equipment that you see him operating here. Going further east, bypassing Toronto just for a moment, um, the Dow Planetarium in Montreal was established also in that same period, the, the, 19, the late 1960s was a very rich uh, period for planetariums in Canada. Uh, it was the beginning of the space age and so there was a lot of interest in that. 
and uh, the Dow Brewery Company in uh, Quebec uh, sponsored the, the operation and the building of the Dow Planetarium. And that operated until uh, 2011 and then was eventually replaced by the planetarium Rio Tinto Alcan in Montreal, um, an elegant piece of architecture that uh, is on the old Olympic site, the Olympic site from 1976. And this was opened in 2013, and uh, I was one of the consultants on this project as well. It's an elegant uh, building with two domes. Uh, one dome uh, was uh, kind of the science dome, and it was a, a more traditional planetarium with concentric seats and a uh, Konica Minolta star projector uh, augmented by uh, once Skyscan and then Evans and Sutherland uh, digital equipment. And the second dome was more of an art experience uh, where they didn't concentrate so much on pure science, but uh, took you on on uh, fanciful tours of the universe, including uh, uh, the, the fact that you could uh, sit on these bean bags and uh, relax and have uh, a wonderful experience. Further east still, uh, Discovery Center in Halifax uh, had ambitions for uh, taking over an old power plant, plant in uh, Halifax and uh, also wanted to include a planetarium dome. And uh, so we constructed a, uh, a small dome, but a, a lovely dome facility with uh, tilted rake seats and um, a facility that includes, again, Evans and Sutherland uh, equipment, digital equipment, no star project, no classical star projector. Those star projectors are not really necessary now, uh, although um, some of us like the idea of a hybrid where you have the star projector and digital equipment. So let's go to Toronto. And uh, there is uh, both a sad and a hopeful story about uh, planetariums in Toronto. And around the same time that I've been talking about in the late 1960s, there was a gift from Colonel Sam McLaughlin to uh, build a planetarium for the, city, for the city of Toronto. It was donated to, initially to the University of Toronto and then to the Royal Ontario Museum and this planetarium was constructed. Um, it was uh, it featured a very large 23 meter uh, dome and a Zeiss Jena uh, projector and something in the order of the nearly 400 seats of the Mammoth Theater. Um, it uh, was next to a subway stop and so it should have been extremely popular. The programming varied a lot. Sometimes it was quite pedestrian, and sometimes it was good. Um, but in the end, uh, the planetarium didn't uh, have as much of a political backing as it might have had. And, uh, and when the ROM decided to close it, I think they wanted to get their hands on the endowment. Um, they, uh, there wasn't as much public outcry as, the, as there might have otherwise been. Another aspect of planning for uh, Toronto was affected by the advent of Ontario Place, which came on stream in 1971 and featured, among other things, the Cinesphere, the giant dome that uh, was uh, the largest movie screen of its kind in the world at the time. Um, and uh, that was the world's first permanent IMAX theater. It featured a projector that had been premiered at Expo 70 in Osaka in Japan and then brought back to Ontario, but that was the, made the, Toronto the first permanent IMAX theater. And this was a derivative of Expo 67. There was, uh, of course, Expo 67 was a seminal event in Montreal uh, where uh, all the, you know, 120 countries came together uh, and had major uh, pavilions and it was the beginning of the explosion of the audiovisual age as well. And uh, that uh, had a profound effect on uh, audiovisual programming in a variety of museums and science centers and planetariums all around the world, including in Toronto with, with the advent of Ontario Place and the first Cinesphere, the first IMAX theater. Meantime, the Ontario Science Centre uh, came along um, and uh, also in the centennial period and uh, 
was a one it's of the, 17 hours one of the two uh, significant science centers in the in the world at the time one being in the exploratorium in san francisco and the other innovative one being the uh, the, the ontario science center you can make an argument that uh, the uh, the old museum the deutsches museum in munich much earlier was one of the progenitors of science centers, but that was a t more of a technology museum as opposed to a modern day science center. One of the aspects of the Ontario Science Center that uh, we've always in enjoyed was the children's programming that uh, for very young and uh, preschool children, uh, and if they get afraid of the dark, this little doll uh, comes over and lights up and, and uh, they, they settle down immediately and and this whole idea of preschool programming is something that i'm very excited about and and is uh, something that uh, planetariums are are beginning to spend a lot more time and effort on i'm just going to go beyond canada for a little bit and talk about the planetarium scene elsewhere across the border and and across the world uh, four of the major planetariums that have attracted a great deal of attention in the United States of the Hayden in New York, the Adler in Chicago that goes back to the 1930s, um, the Griffith in Los Angeles uh, that underwent a, a major $70 million, 100 million Canadian uh, renovation uh, several years ago. Uh, most of that uh, doesn't show up in the picture because of, a lot of it was underground to protect the architectural purity of the building. And then the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. And there are many other planetariums in the United States that have been uh, innovative as well, San Diego and uh, Reno, Nevada, and others that uh, could be the subject of uh, another special program sometime. If we look farther afield, there are major happenings taking place uh, in planetariums, particularly in Asia, almost all the major Asia, Asian cities are building new planetariums. There's an existing one in Shanghai anyway, but this major new planetarium, it's probably half a billion dollars uh, in value is going to open next year and will be uh, uh, it will make a huge splash when it comes on stream. Um, another one of the sophisticated overseas planetariums is the Eugenitas Foundation Planetarium in Athens, Greece. Uh, our friend Bill Chomick has worked on, on that one as well, working with Dennis Simopoulos. And uh, Bill and I worked together on that uh, project. And then going farther afield, there are very sophisticated planetariums. The new, uh, now nearly eight years old now, the re renovated Moscow planetarium, which goes, the original one goes back to 1929. But they did a splendid job of recasting that planetarium, especially in the exhibition area. The exhibition is absolutely beautiful. Um, the Hamburg Planetarium stands out in terms of its programming. It uh, it has uh, th throughout the day, in, in non-COVID times, of course, it has uh, children's shows and little circuses and uh, opera and uh, debates and all kinds of uh, really exciting programming as well as astronomy shows. The St. Petersburg Planetarium is one of the largest in the world. In fact, at the moment, it's the largest in the world. It will be supplanted by Shanghai, but uh, it, uh, it will be the host of the 2022 International Planetarium Society Conference. And in Tokyo, a city I'm quite familiar with uh, and visit often in non-COVID times, there are 29 major planetariums in Tokyo alone. This is one of them, the, uh, the, the uh, Kanaka Minolta commercial planetarium in downtown Tokyo. So it's a big planetarium world out there. Get with it, Toronto. It's time to build a, a proper one in the city. And uh, I think it's uh, well overdue. With that, I will turn the mic back over to uh, my friend, Kirsten. All right, um, 29 in Tokyo. <laughs> 29 planetariums in one city. Wow, but you were telling me the population of Tokyo is Canada the in a city, right? The population of Canada, yes. But so. do we have 29 planetariums in Canada? No, I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. Not if anybody... There are, there, are, there are more than 29 if you consider small ones in Tokyo, but these the, are the 29 yeah. major planetariums. 
Yeah, it's incredible. So we have a lot of work to do, as you say. Um, I just want to remind everybody who's watching that uh, Ian and I are going to have a little conversation um, because I put this together. I get to monopolize his time for a little while. But if you have questions for Ian, please do put them in the YouTube comments or send them to chair at planet, uh, spaceplacecanada.ca. I believe I actually have that written down here. No, I don't. All right. Well, there you go. You can also send it to Twitter. There's our Twitter account, Space Place Canada CDA. And if you want to send a, a question by email, it's chair at spaceplacecanada.ca. Or you can also put them in the YouTube comments. All right. So Ian, I wanted to um, I worked in the United States in the in the planetarium at the California Academy of Sciences before it got all fancy and new. Um, I haven't been there to see the fancy new one yet, but the old one was pretty cool. It's a whole story. Yeah. Yeah. But in the United States, there's the story of the Sputnik kind of launching a bunch of facilities like planetariums, many of them smaller in schools and things. And of course, Sputnik, does anybody remember what year it launched? I'm not going to wait for you to put that in the comments. It was 1957, right? Yeah. October, yeah. October 4th. October 4th, right. <laughs> so by October 10th, there were a bunch of planetariums in the United States. Um, <laughs> Did we see a similar kind of blossoming here or do you attribute the rise of the planetarium in Canada to something different? I think that was somewhat unrelated in Canada, although there was a great deal of interest in the space age generally. I don't think the uh, the, the, the Soviet uh, thing scared Canada as much as it, it scared the Americans. The Americans actually passed a congressional act called the NDEA, the National Defense Education Act, and uh, that act was uh, put in place specifically to fund any educational project that would bring kids along and get them interested in space and astronomy. And so there were a whole bunch of small planetariums built in colleges and universities and high schools, and and then it helped to to underwrite some of the big planetariums as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, so it was kind of a difference. Yeah, in so, Canada, the, the main impetus was around the Canadian centennial in 1967. Right. That was the big push. Yeah. So yeah. all of that construction is centennial sort of cultural Most investment. Related back to that. And yeah. then, of course, Expo 67 was also right. related to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have another sort of unrelated question. Did you explain how you actually got that gig as the first planetarium director in the first planetarium in Canada? Well, I was offered the job and turned it down simply because I was in the broadcasting business and, yeah. uh, and uh, was really enjoying it and thought that that was going to be my career. Um, but I was an amateur astronomer, a member of the Royal Astronomical Society. I helped to promote the idea of the planetarium uh, to commemorate the Queen's visit. Um, but I did that strictly as a volunteer and, and as a, an amateur member of the Astronomical Society. And again, the assumption was that the planetarium would be operated by volunteers. Mm -hmm. And it was just before opening, everybody realized, you know, how do you sell tickets? How do you promote it? How do you, <laughs> it? How do you hire people? You know, and, and, and it was left way too late and certainly left way too late to do any of the intelligent planning that one would do now. The planning was all uh, very slapdash, and, and I, I don't mean to denigrate it by any means. It was, uh, there were a lot of people who spent a lot of time in it, but we didn't know what we didn't know at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but anyway, um, I, I knew the mayor and, and uh, uh, other people in the Parks and Recreation Department through my news connections, and and so. Uh, somebody thought that it would be, be a good idea for me to run the planetarium. I had no managerial experience. Uh, I, I learned management 101 just by doing and made every mistake in the book there too. So there were a lot of mistakes in the early days, but uh, we fumbled our way through and created a, a planetarium. One of the things that happened is because none of us had been in a planetarium before, uh, we knew how to produce television shows and <laughs> And uh, we just figured, well, that's a very big dome, a very big screen. Uh, let's throw some big production elements at it. And, and uh, that's the way we approached it. Whereas right. most planetariums were just simply lectures in the dark at that mm -hmm. time. It's changed now. Mm -hmm. But at that time, they were basically lectures in the dark. Right. And, and we, uh, 
we had a different approach in Edmonton simply because we invented something from the ground up. We weren't hamstrung by, by uh, this is the way you do it because we've already done it. And we've always done it this way. So actually, I've been wondering about that. How different? Okay, so Edmonton, just to be clear, that was kind of a special one because it didn't come in the centennial right. bunch. It was there yeah. because of the Queen coming. So the Thank Queen you. did something good for Edmonton. That's wonderful. I just done a lot of things. I'm not going to comment. Um, but I think you just did. maybe I did. Um, how different were the early planetariums in Canada? You mentioned that you brought a sense of production value to the Edmonton planetarium, and that some of the other planetariums around were the lectures in the dark. Did you, in your experience, find that the Canadian planetariums had a big difference between them? That, and that, don't you know name any names if no. you don't. <laughs> Now, ge generally speaking, I would I would say that the uh, Canadian planetariums learned a lot from each other. We formed an, uh, an association fairly early in the piece. Mm -hmm. It eventually got folded into the Canadian Association of Science Centers. Right. Um, but uh, we we had a, a, a kind of an informal uh, group of people, and we compared notes a lot. And um, and and I would say that partly because of things like the CBC and the National Film Board of Canada and uh, Expo 67 and, and that kind of thing, as, as well as IMAX, there was a fair bit of influence of, of those cultural things uh, on the planetariums in Canada that di didn't necessarily happen elsewhere. And so there was a, a, I would have to say, there was more attention paid to uh, production refinement in uh, planetarium programming in Canada than you would typically find in most other places. These other places did catch up, and certainly uh, Rochester and, and um, San Diego and, and uh, Reno, Nevada, for a variety of peculiar reasons, all contributed to uh, production uh, capabilities being enhanced significantly in the United States as, as well, and so that eventually took hold nearly, right. nearly everywhere. Interesting. Um, that is really interesting. I mean, you think about the CBC and the NFB being these cultural institutions that did tie people together, and they were very influential back in that time. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Um, well, the, the film universe uh, uh, exploded yeah. onto the scene in, in, I think, 1960. I, I'd have to check the date. But uh, that had a profound effect on, on how we looked uh, not only at the universe, but how do we how do we communicate about the universe? And, and we we uh, took that some of the production ideas of that and exploded that onto the big dome. So, just for those who don't know, Universe was a very inf influential film that influenced the look and feel of a lot of big budget motion pictures. Later, was yeah. narrated by William Shatner. Am I right there? No, uh, no, that's a different one. Yeah, no. okay. Yeah. You're right. That's a different one. And uh, but we know it because I think it also was done a little bit up at the David Dunlap Observatory, not yeah. too far from yeah. here. Yeah, that's right. The, the, yeah. Uh, astronomer Don McRae. Oh, Don McRae. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wait, wiping his brow at the end yeah. as, as the dawn was uh, coming on. Yeah, uh, you can see that. I think the NFB catalog is available to view. So I encourage it, everybody it to. Still is a wonderful film. Yeah. It's just called Universe. And if, if anybody who hasn't seen it, it's a must see. It it, it stands up beautifully. And Excellent. You, you get to see the streets of Toronto as they were in 1960. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to see that. <laughs> Different. There was no traffic. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you that you know things have changed since the centennial. Um, there have been smaller er eras of growth. So, for example, Expo 86 that you were involved in, the Calgary Olympics, and then again in 2010, again with the Olympics coming by. Um, but d d have those projects had the same impact as the 67 crew? No, nothing compares to 1967. Uh, one of the reasons that 1967 was, was so uh, influential it was just a matter of accidental timing. That mm. was the, the beginning of the audiovisual age and Expo 67 actually advanced it. I mean, it took, wow. it took what was happening out there anyway in terms of uh, experiments in audiovisual engineering and so forth. And it just took it to uh, an exponential degree. 
and that explosion um, was just a happenstance in in time and place. Uh, it all it, it happened in Montreal at Expo '67, and the the uh, if you, if you revisited any of those things now, they would actually appear quite quaint. Um, uh, but at the time, uh, things like the Czechoslovakian pavilion, uh, the, the 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 Czechoslovak uh, people had two pavilions. And they they were absolutely spectacular. They they introduced the whole idea of of a film that that the audience would interact with, and the audience could dictate uh, the which would direction the story would go in, and they'd interrupt the film several times. Hmm. And and uh, it was a real breakthrough. I mean, that kind of thing would be whole hum today, but it was <laughs> it was it was absolutely. Uh, earth shattering at the time and, and uh, breathtakingly original. Well, that was another interesting insight that I hadn't actually put together, but should have. Um, now you did tell us a little bit about what happened to all those 1967 facilities. And of course, most drastically Toronto's is gone. And you gave a little insight into that. Um, is there any advice you could give against inoculating future projects against the fate of some of those well, Earlier think, ones? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, it starts with governance. Um, I've often made the statement that if you don't get the governance right in an organization, nothing else will go right eventually. Or conversely, mm -hmm. uh, everything will eventually go sideways. And and part of the whole idea of governance is looking after the long term interest of of an institution. Uh, and so uh, the responsibility of a board, I, I, get, I get really frustrated at boards that meddle in day-to-day -day activities and, uh, and dictate the director do this or do that. Uh, that's not what a board should do. A board really should be looking after the long-term health of an organization and looking after the fiduciary responsibilities that uh, encourage uh, reinvestment so that uh, a facility doesn't uh, degrade. Uh, if a facility de degrades a little bit, you can fix it up. If it degrades mm -hmm. a lot, everybody says it, it's going to cost too much to fix it. Right. Uh, Ontario Place is a good example. Uh, they're dealing with that at Ontario Science Center right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're, they're, everybody's looking around and saying, wonderful place in 1967. But uh, holy mackerel, what is it going to cost to fix it up? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I, I see that as a failure of governance over the years. Um, and and uh, that's one of the responsibilities of a board is to look beyond the, 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 the situation at the moment and say, you know, what, what, what's this going to require 10 years from now, a, a generation from now, 50 years from now? Yeah. And that might include a plan for replacement, uh, not only replacement of parts, but uh, you know, a, a complete re uh, overhaul. You can you can plan that ahead if if you uh, have a, a program that where there's buy-in at the at the beginning. But you know, one of the problems is that most governments um, operate on on cycles, you know, on, on election cycles, and, yeah. and can't really think beyond the next election. Yeah, I think. We've all experienced that a little bit this last year. Um, I'm not supposed to say these things. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming in on the comments. So I'd like to turn to one from Rocky, which is what sort of stimulus, cultural, educational, whatever, would bring building a planetarium to the forefront of a Canadian citizen's mind, do you think? In Toronto, presumably. Right? Well, let's say in Toronto because that's what we want, well, right? And, and interestingly enough, there's a, there are plans for a new planetarium in Victoria. Our friend mm -hmm. David Leverton has a, a big plans oh. there. Um, there are some of us that are promoting the idea of a national planetarium in Ottawa. We, we, we think that the that there's a wonderful story about Canada in astronomy and space. Canada is now the second country in the world in terms of astronomy and is a major player in space research as well. And uh, we don't we don't even know that about ourselves. And if you know, and if we had a national planetarium that told that story, not in a nationalistic or jingoistic way, but just in a matter of fact way, incorporating that into the larger story of the universe, uh, that that would uh, that would be an ideal thing. And of course, 
T Toronto being uh, the major city in Canada. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it, 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 it deserves a planetarium that tells part of the national story as well. Mm -hmm. So many visitors to Canada, to Toronto, that come from elsewhere, uh, right. from elsewhere in Canada or from other countries. So uh, it would be a good place to help tell that story as well. I don't know if that answers the question. I, well, I mean, I think, you know, the question is, how could we, I, I don't know. I, I, you and I have discussed this. Do we need another 1967? kind of push use, to fund we could use one we could use one yeah. can we pay for one <laughs> well uh, can, not... <laughs> can you afford not to to to, to yeah. do these things i mean yeah. if, what would canada be if it hadn't been for 1967 i mean yeah. it, it, it we were just a a, a bunch of uh, overgrown villages before 1967 and and uh, uh, Expo 67 and Expo 86. And I can tell you what Expo 86 did in Vancouver. I mean, the, the, this town that I live in now was in fact just a big village. Um, had very little going for it culturally or, or uh, economically. And Expo 67 transformed it into a, a, a world hub. I mean, uh, dozens of airlines came into the new airport and the, the new science center was uh, built and new transportation systems. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and all of that spurted economic growth, the likes of which we, we had, couldn't even have imagined before 1986. Right. So the question really is, can you afford not to do something like this? If you really want to grow economically, the, 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 the one, caveat that I would put on that is that I think there's more sensitivity now to to growth that is eco, that is uh, ecologically sensitive and, mm -hmm. and takes into account the environment and that's fair it, 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 it's something that should happen naturally but but there are even growth potential within that concept as well and that is responsible growth for sure I mean uh, science world BC has done a wonderful job of uh incorporating that kind of thinking into their projects. Um, we had another question. Well, here's the million dollar question. What do you think the probability of getting a planetarium in Toronto in the next decade is? You know, <laughs> Maybe we should do a vote. Everybody put your comments and your, your chances in the comments and see what you think. <laughs> I, I, I can't see it not happening. Uh, I, I, Toronto and Sydney, Australia are the only two major cities in the world, in the world that don't have a, a significant major planetarium. And I've been involved with the, with the project in, in three different uh, projects in Sydney, trying to get a, a planetarium happening there and all kinds of reasons that that hasn't happened. Uh, but well, we're uh, in good company anyway. <laughs> yes. Toronto should at least beat Sydney and let Sydney be the last. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. So I don't know if anybody wants to weigh in on that. I, I thought. hadn't thought of that before, but there, there's a challenge out there. <laughs> We're let, let's be, Sydney Sydney. be the last city in the world to not to have a major planetarium. And they've got a big, beautiful observatory in the downtown, even it's like lovely, right, lovely old um, uh, observatory yeah. going back to the 1700s, and, yeah. and uh, it's With just great cool. exhibits and yeah, yeah. Lo lo lovely. But it's a small facility, and it's cramped, and it's in the rocks, and yeah. it's, uh, uh, away from the downtown area, and it's hard to get to. And, Is it? <laughs> I always got there okay, but oh, okay. Yeah, no, no, it's just not on a major transportation it's route, and, and there's no parking. You know. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. Um, we had another uh, from Winta who wondered how you would describe a sustainable planetarium. So I guess I don't know if uh, Winta means uh, ecologically sustainable, but I suspect uh, Winta means something more like how can you? What's yeah. the model to operate a thing so that it doesn't? Yeah. That's a, a really excellent question, and and um, I, I think th th that here is where the Americans do have an edge on the rest of us, uh, because uh, it's partly their tax structure and and mm -hmm. partly the, their mechanism for handling private uh, donations in philanthropy. But you take planetariums like uh, New York or the Adler in Chicago. Um, uh, Los Angeles is different. That's that's run by the city, 
Um, mm -hmm. And the city just accepts that as part of its tourist responsibility. Uh, but uh, the Adler is a good example in Chicago. First of all, they, they do, now they've gone through a bad patch and, and COVID has really complicated things and they've had to lay off staff and everything mm -hmm. else. But, but if, you, if you look at the normal operation there, they have uh, really well-produced programs. They have excellent staff, they have uh, excellent docents, um, and, and they have excellent public services, really good cafe and, yeah. and a, a wonderful place to view the city and all of those things. And so it's a major tourist destination and it's in a cluster of places that has other museums, you know, aquarium and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those things together uh, mean that it's commercially viable. And on top of that, uh, they've got an excellent donor base and, they, and, and they've got an organization that pays a lot of attention to its donors and sponsors as well yeah. as the gate revenue and so forth. So that's the model really to, to aspire to is some combination of public funding, but as much concentration as possible on gate revenue and, and, and doing such a great job that everybody wants to come and doesn't mind spending uh, a good, at least the value of a movie ticket and something yeah. more, uh, yeah. you know, that, that, that should be kind of the baseline. Yeah. It's not cheap these days, no. but yeah, Griffith is a wonderful spot. So is Adler. I mean, there there's yeah. some really good examples in the United States that we could see. Yeah. Um, we had another question from Leo of what your top three design considerations for a planetarium would be. So this may be a little more in the actual design of the place. So you, you mentioned a few of the things that you should have around it. A good cafe, I would definitely agree with. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any other things? Well, um, I would start with the public amenities. Uh, it has to be a place that people are comfortable in. It has to be a place that's attractive, that's either really beautiful or remarkable as a piece of architecture that attracts attention. Mm -hmm. uh, you, when you look at what the, the museum in Bilbao did in Spain, mm -hmm. uh, that transformed the sleepy village into a major tourist of one museum. Um, and and uh, you know and and uh, inspired growth of major airport and highways and and all kinds of infrastructure and everything else. So that uh, so making sure that you've got something that's attractive and and deals with the public well, you know, in in terms of the amenities. The second major thing would be the the technical um, and programmatic aspect. Um, um, and that's partly a design issue and it's partly a staffing issue. Mm -hmm. You have to have the right kind of uh, directorship and staffing um, that doesn't treat it as an academic institution. Uh, that, that, you know, the, having academic background is fine and, and, and one could even argue essential, but to, to let that dominate uh, over the, the business of creating program programmatic uh, events and um, um, and shows that uh, the public really want to see and having technical facilities that uh, that can grow with the technology that, that can be adapted to new technology that take advantage of new technology um, there, there there are no fixed ideas in my book as far as whether you, whether you have tilted domes or one-way seating or concentric seating there are simply arguments for and against everything you can think of uh, as far as a format for a, a planetarium. And so uh, the, the trick is to have people who understand that process and make intelligent choices, knowing what the pros and cons are of all the choices you make and right. make the choices deliberately. Uh, and then once you make them, then you make the best of the choices you've done. There are no absolutes in terms of... Uh, of uh, what what works or what doesn't work a lot of people do have uh, preferences or believe very strongly in one thing or another and that's fine i guess but i, I think it's better to uh, to keep an open mind in terms of planning and and look at the particular circumstances of any given situation in in terms of what else is available uh, in the immediate area and, and where the technology is going and uh, yeah. other trends and simply plan around those parameters rather than having a fixed idea about what, what I like better than, uh, than some other. Uh, what should be, 
I, I remember in the 2000s when everybody was shifting away from optical projectors, yeah. uh, that there was a real sense that they were going to be missed. So we actually had someone, you know, to ask me about this. But before I get to your question, Alan, um, is that um, the focus of a planetarium used to often be when you come in is the wonderful piece of engineering that you were experiencing. So people would introduce you. The machines had names like Harold or yeah. whatever, um, but there became a sense that that was not what the theater was for and the focus should actually be on the content and not on the delivery mechanism. Um, do you think that's still true? Do you think people are still, are we all a bunch of gearheads that really like to talk about our motors and light bulbs well, and stuff? Well, interestingly <laughs> enough, um, when we were building the, the planetariums in Rochester and Vancouver, uh, there were arguments about putting the instrument on an elevator, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, um, there had been in, uh, planetarium instruments on elevators before in Pittsburgh and in London. London, um, uh, they wanted the they they wanted the planetarium projector to be in the lower lower foyer when people came into the building, and they would see the projector. Uh, in in this glass cage and be mm -hmm. awed by this piece of machinery, and then mm -hmm. later on it would come up into the the theater as as kind of a gimmick, um, uh, and I I hated the idea. I, I thought that was that was a dreadful thing because it it put the emphasis on a machine, not on, not on the universe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, they put their instrument on an elevator because the, uh, the Planetarium Theater was sponsored by Westinghouse and they wanted to be able to show refrigerators and, <laughs> and washing machines. On, on, Are you kidding? On, no, the, no. Oh, wow. It's That's a very, hilarious. Very known, little known story. And so they wanted, to get, in there. Of, <laughs> they wanted to get rid of the uh, instrument. The, <laughs> in, in Rochester and Vancouver, our, our strategy was completely different. We wanted to, to have no emphasis on the machinery at all. You couldn't see any of the auxiliary projectors. They were all mm -hmm. hidden. The, the the Zeiss projector was hidden. The idea was that uh, when it got dark enough, all of a sudden it would just slip into view and all of a sudden you'd have the starry sky. Right. And that would just appear out of absolutely nowhere. And and uh, and so there was a complete de-emphasis on, on the machinery. We mm -hmm. even had the instrument, that was the original place where we had the instrument painted blue because we wanted the blue to uh, cam be fat camouflaged against the blue sky of the, ah. uh, of the late daylight. Uh, I so. didn't know that. That is completely new fact for me. I just thought that was like a design quirk of Zeiss uh, at the uh, time. Uh, oh, Zeiss. Your fought, fault. That was my fault. Uh, Zeiss fought us on that and... and uh, <laughs> And 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 just said they wouldn't do it, and we said, "Well, we'll go to Zeisiana, and we, <laughs> uh oh, they, they will do anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but for, for hard currency, they would they would do anything. Just for those who are don't remember, Jena was in East Germany, so yeah, they, yeah. yeah they were struggling. Zeiss yeah. Oberkoken was in West Germany, West Germany, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Zeiss Jena was in East Germany, and and until Canada came along, um. Uh, Everybody from the Soviet bloc bought from Zeiss Jena, and everybody from the Western bloc bought from from Zeiss Oberkoken. Um, and uh, and then uh, we had Vancouver, Toronto, and Calgary all went with uh, the East German Zeiss because it, the, they were more amenable to making changes than the Western <laughs> were. And and. and uh, there's a story about Rochester too. I managed to get a, a, a congressional act uh, or an act of Congress uh, that would allow us to buy an instrument from East Germany if we could prove technical superiority. <laughs> and that, that was what, how, what we were able to hold over the West Germans and get a better deal and including getting the instrument painted blue. So they, they bowed to the pressure of the US Congress. Well, we didn't, well we, didn't threat have, of. we didn't we didn't have to use that but we, okay. we we had it in our back pocket planetarium diplomacy i like it yeah. we need more of it that's a fascinating story i had not heard that ever we were playing hardball at the time <laughs> uh, the end the, the, the zeiss companies were very difficult to deal with because they they were very fixed in their ideas of what you know what needed to be done and, and how to approach these things we had our own ideas of what uh, what we wanted to do, and, uh, mm -hmm. and we were how dare you? Yeah, and and we were young and stupid at the time. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> I, here's I, it's, <laughs> it's very funny because uh, yeah, I've seen a few blue zeiss, even the small KP3s, yeah. the little the little ones yeah, were blue. Yeah, yeah. Many, many of them were colored blue after that. After that, and Gotos are purple, I think, aren't they? Yeah, they're some of them. Yes, uh, very, yeah. uh, very iridescent purple. It's like tractors. They all have their own brand color. Um, yeah, yeah. We have a couple more questions before we wrap up. Okay. Alan, uh, well, uh, Alan wanted to know if uh, allowing for changes in technical design, which of course we have had to deal with over the last 20 years, display technologies rendered the optical mechanical projectors obsolete. So that's like a Zeiss. And now we have video projection and then coming down the pipe is VR. And I know you and I have talked about that, but how do you can you design to allow for VR, do you think? I mean, I know you're not, you know, maybe it's, it's pretty cutting edge still and yeah. it's not really out there yet, but do you have any? Well, one, one of those 29 planetariums in Tokyo has a VR room um, and a, a whole bunch of uh, pods that you, you can sit in and, and you have your VR, <laughs> VR experience and you can, you can be twinned with somebody else uh, and, and you can have kind of a, a shared experience with another mm. person. That begins to address one of the major flaws of VR as far as a, a, a public facility is concerned, because it tends to be an isolating experience, mm. whereas uh, I think some of us are looking at planetariums uh, ideally as a shared social experience. Right. Uh, that's the ideal. Um, and, and VR hasn't uh, solved that yet, although Tokyo uh, kind of <laughs> works around the edges of that and has yeah. something that, that, uh, that gives you a little bit of a shared experience. Is, is it again almost putting the technology ahead of the purpose? Yeah, I think there's too much emphasis on the technology. Mm -hmm. The one thing that is coming along is, is uh, LED screens. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that, uh, that that's going to descend on the business very quickly. And, right. um, and I think that will transform the, the business significantly because at the moment, one of the problems in planetarium domes is cross reflection. Uh, right. It, it had never was a problem with stars or dim images, but as soon as you put anything bright on, then you get cross reflection and mm -hmm. the, the images wash each other out. So uh, LED direct um, uh, viewing uh, at least holds the, the promise of addressing that, and and um, that that has uh, some excitement attached to it. It's a very expensive solution at the moment, yeah. but everybody is banking on the fact that uh, the, the, those costs will inevitably come down or you'll get more pixels uh, right. per dollar than, than, uh, you know, as time goes on. That's a, it's really interesting. I remember we were looking at that almost 20 years ago at the Academy of Sciences and trying to do a an exhibit with them in a globe to show different, and I think that's happening now. Um, it is. Yes. It's really possible. I've seen some neat art installations that yes, use that. Yes. There's a, a, a big one happening in, in Las Vegas soon and uh, at Lowell Observatory in, in uh, Arizona, where I'm working with Bill Peters now. Yeah. We, we've got an LED uh, solution to uh, one of the projection rooms that we're doing in there. That's, it's very cool. Actually, I wanted to give you an opportunity to just mention those two big projects. I mean, they're not in Canada, and there may be reasons why, but Lowell Observatory, for those of you who don't know, is where Pluto was discovered. <laughs> and, and Pluto is going to be a planet at Lowell Observatory, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it they is, don't care. It is, it is currently a planet. <laughs> Okay, um, a big refresh down at uh, Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, and then the other one a little closer to home um, in Wisconsin at the Yerkes Observatory. Yeah. Yes, uh, Bill and I, uh, Bill Peters and I wrote the master plan for the redevelopment of the Yerkes Observatory. The, the University of Chicago ran Yerkes Observatory for 120 years, mm -hmm. uh, and eventually, uh, two years ago, just decided to get out of that business. And so a local foundation in Williams Bay was formed to uh, run the observatory and to raise the money to to upgrade it. It's degraded terribly in terms of just the physical facility. Right. So uh, it. Um, uh, so we've written the master plan for that, and that's a multi-year plan, about a ten-year plan or so. And they've just hired a new director, 
and uh, he's come on board, uh, and um, we're we're hopeful that uh, they'll they'll do some exciting things with that, including mm -hmm. uh, an eventual planetarium in space, Excellent. or or on the campus somewhere. So field trip in the future. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, Lowell Observatory in Arizona. Uh, we've already opened the first phase of the master plan that Bill and I wrote, and that is the Geo Valley Open Deck Observatory, which is a uh, a deck with six very high-end telescopes on it, fixed telescopes, uh, and a uh, rolling roof that comes and covers them at, at night. And, and um, it's an elegant, beautiful facility, and that's already open. And they're doing uh, programs now, uh, premium programs for select audiences. Uh, in the COVID period, they have to, you know, a whole bunch of protocols around that for very small audiences. Uh, yeah. but when that reopens, that that, that was already a, a very successful thing. And then the next phase is a big new astronomy discovery center that will have an open deck observatory on the roof, looking at the real sky with heated seats and oh. and a screen <laughs> that allows you to show close-up images of uh, of objects and so forth. It'll be quite exciting. And then an audiovisual screen and children's area and, and uh, exciting exhibits. It's, it's going to be really, really exciting. And that will be open on uh, Percival Lowell's birthday in March of 2023. Uh, definitely worth a, a trip. Uh, it's a wonderful site. So you had a wonderful it, site it, to work with. Oh, my goodness. It, yeah, it, it, absolutely beautiful. And I get, I get to stay in Clyde Tombaugh's apartment when I, when I visit there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> that's pretty cool. I know. When I you say? when you can travel again, you'll have to send us pictures. Um, yeah, we I travel. I don't remember. Oh yeah, something about a thing that flies through the air. I don't know. Um, we had another just a couple of questions. One from the viewers, and then one for me to finish up. So Ainsley would like to know if it's possible that rather than building a major planetarium in Toronto, it might be possible or maybe more practical and economically viable to build something maybe not quite as major in the outskirts. So I know this is something that we wrestle with um, and uh, I have my opinions, but we're not here to hear my opinions. Um, well, <laughs> I, I'm fairly agnostic on that uh, topic. I, I, I think that if, if, um, if one of the suburbs decided uh, and, and they had the wherewithal and, and the, uh, and the political will and and the sponsorship and, and they were able to pull all of that together and and pull together a, say a medium size or even a large planetarium um, that could be the toronto planetarium or it could be a, a, a localized or more regional planetarium there'd be nothing wrong with that it's a big enough city that uh, you mm -hmm. know it, it, it something in the western part of the city could serve mississauga oakville uh, Brampton, you know that whole segment of things, not to write off the rest of the city, but uh, but that you could take that approach. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a question of opportunism. Is, is the opportunity there, and and does somebody want to spearhead a, a project and get it done? I don't think there'd be anything wrong with that, and I don't think if that were to happen, it should necessarily uh, get in the way of doing a major um, cultural. Uh, educational facility in downtown Toronto. I, I, it's a big enough city, uh, both in terms of the intrinsic population and the tourism flow in ordinary times, that you could easily justify more than one planetarium. So we and agree. The, yeah, and I, the University of yeah. Toronto is looking at a, a, yep. a planetarium too. And, and, Absolutely. Uh, and and the, the Omnimax Theatre in at Ontario Science Centre undoubtedly at some point we'll we'll have at least some capability of doing planetarium type programming yeah i wouldn't worry about that i think you know mm -hmm. the, the, the real question is is are all of these things going to be done at such a level of quality that they justify their own long-term existence so yeah as i said we agree the more the merrier and it would be better if everybody collaborated and shared uh julie yeah. earlier said that you know planetarians people who work in planetarians are very very generous with their time and knowledge uh absolutely. she says they're the most generous folks when it comes to knowledge sharing so absolutely it's yeah a, it's a wonderful culture in, in the business mm -hmm. and, and it's uh 
which is predicated on the whole idea of sharing ideas or stealing ideas or something in between. <laughs> So I just wanted to have one last question uh, that's double parted here. There's been a lot of change in the field since the early days, full dome video to database driven navigable star fields. Um, what do you think the change that has had the biggest impact, good or bad on the planetarium experience? And what do you think has stayed the same despite all of these changes? I think if you go back to the uh, the basics, I think one of the reasons that the planetarium exploded onto the scene in 1924, we're coming up to the centennial by the way, mm. uh, in, in, uh, in a couple of years, and the uh, International Planetarium Society is going to be having a whole series of uh, awareness programs around that uh, centennial starting in, in, in 2022 uh, up to 2024. And the the international conference of IPS will in 2024 will be held in Germany. There are companies yeah. that are, are vying for the uh, the opportunity. Um, that's a, a, an aside. But but the point that I was going to make is the that when the planetarium came onto the scene in the early 1920s. Um, there was no other audiovisual stuff happening. There was certainly no IMAX or, or no, no television, no, you know. So just the simple idea of projecting stars with a lecturer was was seen as a major <laughs> breakthrough in terms of, uh, of something that was like an audiovisual experience. Um, that experience, that um, kind of overlay I think has been kind of a continuum that has uh, that has kind of stuck with the planetarium business and and to good effect. I think uh, I think the whole idea of of uh, immersing people in um, with uh, in among the stars and galaxies and 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 on the lunar surface or whatever. Uh, the fact that we're able to do it with more sophistication than they were able to do in twenty twenty or nineteen twenty four. Um, is is beside the point. It, it, it's kind of it's part of the continuum that has made the planetarium kind of stick out. Um, the the corollary or the downside is that there's so many other things that have come along, including IMAX mm -hmm. and, and uh, giant screen TV in, in people's own living rooms and everything else that uh, that means that uh, planetariums have to uh, do have to work extra hard at providing something that that takes the idea of the shared social experience and does something special with that you don't have a shared social experience with your big screen tv in your rumpus room um, you just don't i mean you might with a couple of people watching the same show but, but you know it depends on who's got the control <laughs> yeah uh, so, it could get ugly, yeah. <laughs> yeah it does. So um, the the idea of of uh, of of fixating on the shared social experience and doing something special with that in in a in a way that uh, that no other medium can is the trick, and 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 that gives you all, all kinds of latitude. There's a tremendous amount of latitude that you can build into that, but the key idea is building on the shared social experience. Right. I think that's a fantastic place to finish up the conversation. I just wanted to thank you. Um, it has been a pleasure to work with you for all of these years and hear these ideas. Uh, it's just great to have a chance to grill you on them tonight. Uh, thank you very much for giving your time both to the project and also to our event this evening. Well, very much appreciate it. Thank you, Kirsten. And thanks to everybody looking in, too. It's, uh, I wish we were in one room and we could uh, shake hands, but... Uh, uh, yeah, we, soon. We, virtually. Soon. The vaccines are coming, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we know. Yeah, All take, right, well... Take your jabs. Yeah, well, soon, we hope. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, just okay. hang around. I'm going to remove you from the stream. Hang around. I'm just going to wipe uh, wrap up here. So again, thank you for everybody who joined us. I hope you enjoyed that this evening. A lot of really good ideas there. I've been hearing a lot of these things for years, but even I learned something really new today, that blue projector. That was very cool. Uh, I know that you've been seeing um, 
Henry's uh, posts in the side in the comments about donating. If you want to renew your membership, let me just remind you that if you do that tonight, you can get a wonderful music download card for me. McLaughlin Planetarium was the music of Michael Dana. Uh, so I really am enjoying that. And uh, I'd like to thank Richard McDonald for organizing that for us. Um, and we also have the other swag. Remember, $50 to renew your membership, get the uh, Planetarium music download card. If you add $25, you can get a face mask, add another $25 and we'll give you a book. So if you want to do that, send a note to chair at spaceplaceplanetarium.ca or you can just check our website spaceplacecanada.ca sorry it is spaceplacecanada.ca is everything chair at and the website and you can click donate and remember if you do that please give us your email address so we know who has donated and we can send you your swag all right thanks very much for joining us tonight i wish you a good evening and we'll see you again hopefully in a few weeks